was always excited. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
of what they made in from their crime because they have to pay the victim back and pay their forfeiture. What happens though, in 99.9% .9 of cases, the defendants don't have that kind of money. They can't pay their forfeiture and they can't separately pay their victims either one in full. So our goal is not to forfeit the money and keep it. We want to get it back to the victim. So we are able to oftentimes pay our money to the restitution order to make the victim whole. Because <coughs> these types of things that I 100% um, certain Pam talked about, about why forfeiture is such a useful tool early in the case as opposed to restitution at the end of the case when the assets are likely liquidated, gone, you're never going to find them, you don't have a way to attach them or get them to the victim. So your forfeiture tools that Pam went over get those funds reserved and preserved up at the beginning of your case. And this is an important slide because I have seen cases that have listed um, foreign governments, and it was environmental or wildlife trafficking cases as victims. Um, one I'm thinking of, I believe, is a Mexican conservation fund is listed in the restitution order. So we have cases where you could have restitution on the right, some cases with forfeiture that don't have victims, a drug case we don't consider as having a victim, and then you have the cases in the middle that can have both. And we'll talk about why, but the government of uh, Mexico's conservation fund doesn't meet the requirements of our forfeiture regulations as a victim. So they would only be in the yellow side of the slide as opposed to the green in the middle, and we can't use our forfeiture funds for those victims, so there might be some other paths you want to take. Instead of forfeiting, maybe you send it straight to restitution and skip the forfeiture process if that is possible and make sure that your victims still get compensated because our goal at the end of the day is to do what we can to get the victims the money and if forfeiture isn't the right means to do that, then you know pick another option out of the toolkit of restitution rules or if you have special fish and wildlife restraint rules or your fund, we would encourage you to do that instead because we sort of at the beginning of a case want to sit down and think about end game and maybe forfeiture isn't the right middle step to get you there. Um, I'm not sure if you've seen this, if you're here with the NRD, it's part of the Department Victim Witness Assistance Guidance. They talk about forfeiture in there a little bit. It's an interesting document to read. It goes very into the weeds about restitution, which I am not um, an expert on. EOUSA and the U.S. attorneys are, are really more experts on that. But there are very um, definitive rules and statutes about who can be listed in a restitution order. So I have seen judges list almost anything. So there's a lot of wiggle room there if you're trying to get something listed as a victim. If you can fit it in the restitution statute and use this guidance to get someone or a country listed, then um, that would be great. And we have just talked about restitution. So are there any questions on restitution before I go on to the other two that really tie to forfeiture? Or on the phone too. I have a question. Certainly. So we'll use Madoff as an example because it's in the news. We've had 60,000 people file a petition, we call it, with us. We don't require them to do any kind of tracing of funds. So the person who invested that last day before they took down Madoff does not get treated any differently than someone who invested on day one. So we basically, if we don't have enough money, do a pro rata allocation between the victims. Um, in some instances, we have internally um, been given discretion to set priorities. For instance, we've had Medicare might be a victim, State Farm or Nationwide might also be a victim, and then a small individual might be a victim. And if we pay State Farm and Medicare in that same case, it leaves a very little amount of a pro rata share. So we might say we'll pay the individual first and then deal with the federal or big insurance company entities just to give a little bit of parity because the losses are so um, extreme from one end of the spectrum to the other. So we, we can take things like hardship into consideration, but in 99% of our victim cases, we don't have enough money, unfortunately, and everyone is in the same situation, just whether they invested first or last is not something that we look at. All right, so basically the way this works um, is you use what Pam talked about over here, all the forfeiture tools, and the uh, seizure warrants and all of those methods that she went through with you today is the first step. And then you can either forfeit or not forfeit. And I alluded to this a minute ago that sometimes not forfeiting or discontinuing that part is a better option if the end game is to get money to a victim who won't fall under the regulations that I'm going to talk about here in a minute. 
if you do go through all the way to the end of the forfeiture, the money goes into the fund, and then we can have a victim file a petition, like in Madoff, we have 50,000 of these to go through. Um, or if there is a court-ordered restitution order, the U.S. attorney can ask us to send the money to the clerk and basically have the clerk pay it. So those of you from ENRD, if you're prosecuting a case, you would be able to make that request to us, that we forfeited a case, we have an identifiable victim, meet your right, please transfer the money to the clerk of court to pay out. We don't initiate those transfers on our own. Our office is a centralized decision maker for the whole country, so everything comes to us. We don't drum up business, I guess, for lack of a better word, so it's on the, uh, the onus is with the individual offices to know which cases they have that they need to send it to us. We get some from, like, the fraud division, public integrity, so other DOJ sections are also using this process. Um, restitution, we talked about this, so I'm going to skip this since we're on. Um, had Pam, I think, in Nicole's conversation was probably more on point, so I'm glad they took some more of my time. But most of you nodded when you asked about seeing a restitution order. Here's what it looks like. It generally lists the victim and the amount, and it's mandatory. The court has to order restitution. They don't have a choice um, under the MVRA. And as part of this, the CVRA, which is the Crime Victims' Rights Act, requires that as DOJ employees, we do anything that we can to make sure that victims get full and timely restitution which is why we take the forfeiture money and our policy to give to victims very seriously because we're directed to by the CBRA to make sure we're getting victims their full compensation. Um, and the issue with restitution, you can get a lot of things, which is why sometimes our victims and forfeiture don't match. Attorney's fees, investigative costs, anything that they might have incurred sort of in proximate cause from the crime, they can include. Our regs are a little bit different. We don't cover things like attorney's fees, uh, medical bills, those are not losses that are covered under our regulations. So this might be one of the reasons that you have an injured victim. We see this a lot with, um, in some drug cases, they have deaths, which we would not compensate for. They might not want to complete the forfeiture. They can send the money to the restitution order instead. Um, and remission is the one where um, Craig had mentioned specifically your interest in how the remission process works. It's done by regulation, 28 CFR Part 9 are our remission regs. The least Fish and Wildlife has your own remission regs for your administrative. Their own process to be rewritten. Yes. yes, yes. So I think you may know a little bit about the, the concept of it. I don't know if it works similarly to our regs or not, but we can give money to victims, which is you know, the biggest one, but also owners and leaseholders. So if your um, defendant who you took his leopard from so chooses, and we have a judicial case, he could file a petition to get his leopard back. The key is that you have to be an innocent owner, so obviously he violated whatever import paperwork requirements he was required to do. We're not going to give him his leopard back. Um, we occasionally will get a spouse on a, something that's not contraband. We'll come in and say, that is also my car. He was driving it. He was doing the drug deal with it. I didn't know. We might, in those instances, choose to give the car back to the innocent spouse um, if it's not something that is contraband because it was violating one of the treaty laws. We've had people ask for um, money that we sold in the case in Washington from fish. The fish or crabs, I think, were liquidated because they actually were able to be sold. And they came in saying, well, it's all right. We were allowed to have the fish. We just had too much. So we're really innocent. You should give us all that money back. And we said no because we didn't have the right treaties or the, the right export permits or the right quota permits and all the things. So they were denied and tried over and over again to get the money back, but did not uh, win. Lien holders are the other group that we will give a petition for remission for. On um, facilitating property is probably where you see it. If your uh, poacher is driving around in a car to facilitate his poaching, I'm guessing you can probably grab that under your forfeiture authorities. If GMAC has a lien on that car, we will release the car to them or pay them out the value of their lien from our sale proceeds. Um, can you talk a little bit about the liquidation process. If, if an asset is seized, say the marshals have it, and, and we decide it's better to have it sold at auction, and, and maybe they get far less than, than the importer thought it was worth, but what, what, is that then the relevant pot of money, or is it? Yes. <laughs> yes. So setting aside sort of the unique assets that you guys do 
with a car that was seized as a facilitating property, if GMAC has a $20,000 lease on it, but we take that car, we have fees for storing it that are going to come off the top after we sell it, and maybe we only sell it for $10,000 because it's an auction and we get what we can take from these nationwide auctions. They don't want to hold them for months upon months and maybe get a little bit better of a bid. They will get the proceeds, the auctioneer gets their fee, their commission for doing the auction, any kind of appraisal fees, anything associated with the auction that particular asset are taken off the top, and we would pay the lien holder only what we have left after that. Or if it was, in an instance, if it was a spouse, we'd already sold the car, it doesn't matter that it was worth $20,000, we would probably only give her back the nine or 10 that we netted after the auction. Are there situations where this all happened, uh, let's say it's a perishable item like, like the fish, or whatever, and, and it gets sold, and then you proceed with the litigation and the government are you on the hook for the entire prior amount? Uh, we that? would give, if we lost that fish case, we would give them back what we had sold it for. Okay. We, there may be in something like that, if we lost the case, we might waive some of our storage fees or things like that because we're, we lost the case. But we aren't on the hook. If they thought it was valued at a million dollars and we only sold it for half a million dollars, we don't have to come up okay. with the gap. But, um, and in those <coughs> cases, those sales, of perishables are usually, I think, by interlocutory sale orders where the, the judge is authorizing that to happen. So it's not like the marshal service just up and decided to sell something. They were doing it pursuant to an order. Um, we've had a lot of defendants, you know, say they, they get a money judgment against them that they owe X dollars to the government, and we start seizing assets and applying them to the money judgment, and they're worth much less at sale than they actually think they should be getting credit for. And we say, you know, this is what it was sold for. We can't control the market out there. We've run into situations with some of the customs cases we see where they, they have one value that they put on it in the, the paperwork they give to customs to avoid the customs fees, another value they put on it for insurance, and another value, let's say it's a piece of art that was what they actually paid for it and it was appraised at maybe in the auction house. Does that have any impact on what happens with these cases? None at all? No, I mean, I think it's evidence that they were trying to do something wrong. Yeah, they're, they're different um, paperwork, but the, the marshals have, uh, and the Treasury Department has art appraisals that they know and they go to, so they're independent people who come in and give appraisals. They would not rely on the paperwork from the, the person who was putting it in to sort of set their auction bid based on what he wrote down. They would get an independent appraisal of pretty much everything. They'll do a, a blue book on a car, but jewelry or tangibles, they usually get someone outside. We had a 17th century, what was it, German crucifix was put down as basically a souvenir or something? Yeah, I mean, we had, there was a case I was just over, I don't know who, it was customs, I guess. It was a painting came in and they wrote that it was, um, I guess, like an art craft work being sent here for Christmas and it had a value of like five or ten dollars, but they were sending it um, very expensive post to a climate controlled facility. So customs <laughs> thought maybe there's something weird here. Why would you send a five or ten dollar piece of art to a climate controlled facility? And it was a stolen Picasso. So <laughs> it was returned to the French government a couple months ago. Um, so we do a lot of repatriation of things that we can figure out are stolen or so illegal. Do you guys have a system for doing that? Yes, that we, issue that comes up. we do it through the remission process. So the government of France filed a remission petition. Their owner slash victim, because it was a theft from their country, um, but a lot of the cultural items, uh, we had dinosaur bones we gave back to China a couple weeks ago. Their government, by their law, sort of has ownership of any kind of cultural property in their country. So they file a remission petition and explain, here's what our law says, this item falls under that, and it, it all has to be translated like they were talking about so we can read it, and then we grant their petition and transfer it back to them. So. The issue is once it's forfeited, it's the, gov the U.S. government, so we have to have a mechanism to get it back to them. Um, and a lot of those cultural cases, they may stop short of forfeiture. I don't know if Fish and Wildlife was involved with the snakes in Utah. That was a different agency. But there were, they were white snakes um, illegally exported from Brazil and being bred here. So in that case, they filed a civil forfeiture complaint. Brazil actually filed a claim and came into the judicial process. So instead of forfeiting, since they were already there, they just essentially granted the claim and turned the snakes back over that way. A lot of times the foreign countries don't come and get involved in the process, though, and so at that point, the only way to get it back
back out of the government of the U.S. Is ownership is to remit it back to the country. That's what happened with some of the African countries. Yeah. Some of the things, yeah. It's probably much cheaper. I would think, I mean, there's no cost to filing a remission petition. You don't have to have an attorney, whereas if you're filing a country, you're going to hire someone, file your claim in the court process, you're going to have to meet all the court requirements, pay the fees, and then you'll get to write them back the same way as if you just waited till it was forfeited, which also lets us extinguish any other potentially interested parties' rights. So the defendant can't claim the ban as you know part of the forfeiture case. This is done, it's forfeited. We have a case now where the company filed a petition and the country. So we have to rule on them both, figure out are we denying the company and letting them they get an appeal. I don't know if you're right to allow for that an appeal process, let that run and then we'll grant the um, the dinosaur sculptures or dinosaur fossils to the country once the company's interests are resolved in the remission process. So this is definitely something to look at if you're seeing sort of cultural items. BLM gets a lot of Native American artifacts, and BLM has actually filed a petition because under some of the Native American laws, they are the entity that if no tribe can be identified, it goes to BLM for educational use or uh, display in some of their museums. So I don't know if Fish and Wildlife has any equivalent statutes that would grant you ownership of these contraband leopards and things that we would essentially grant a remission petition for. I think Marshall's is transferring them to you now as like official use. The sense once they're forfeited, you guys keep them as official use um, once they're done. It's, I'm not sure if that's the end of Well, we don't, we, we do our own forfeitures, so. That oh, all, they're all admin. They're almost, almost all of our forfeitures happen outside the Marshall's process right now. So that kind of stuff, they have never, historically it's played much interest. It's not saleable, yeah, they don't it's not know. disposable. We have a repository, which is a fun place to store if anybody ever wants to go and you're in Denver, let me know, I can hook you up. Um, <laughs> but um, it's got all this crazy stuff in it. Um, tiger skin jackets. And, I mean, you can dress like a pimp from the summer <laughs> like five minutes. Yeah, and that's the stuff that the marshals don't want to pay someone to store it when we're never going to sell it because they don't want to reintroduce it back into the stream. So that's the kind of thing that we would hope that you guys would take custody and retain custody of. Um, so this is where you have your own fish and wildlife rights. When you do your administrative process and don't have a court filing, you are in charge of whatever happens to those assets, funds, vehicles. If it goes judicial, civil, or criminal, that's why it ends up at our office because the, the rights provide for two different paths. So um, I'm not sure if your regs have a process that if someone files a petition in your administrative case, but then you do go to a U.S. Attorney's Office because a claim comes in, if those petitions get shifted over to our office, uh, we find that's a gap even with our own agencies, that they get lost in the shuffle and they don't make their way to us. Um, but if you do have petitions coming in on cases that do go with the NRD or with the U.S. Attorney's Office as opposed to just through Fish and Wildlife, then they would have to come over to us. You mean the part where you have to file a claim because they decided that they wanted to file a claim, claim. and you have to the file a complaint? Yeah, that, they've been doing the U.S. Attorney. We've done stuff when they go to the U.S. Attorney's Office. We see more people filing claims than we used to. And we, I expect when our new forfeiture rates go out, because we will be tightening up the remission process and tying it more closely to the underpinning conservation statutes, I would expect to see the claims go up even more, which is why I'm glad we're developing a bit more of a relationship with you guys and the DNRD civil is interested, because I do expect that to happen. Yeah, we've seen, uh, you know, I don't know, we get a lot of claims in on our normal cases. I think people may favor the remission process in some instances because they don't have to go to court and they don't have to participate in the process of depositions and discovery. They just file their petition and FBI or DA has to go interview them and investigate it to see what their claims are and if it's legitimate, but they don't have that whole litigation burden, especially if you're a victim. We don't want you involved in the court process because we don't want to fight with you only to want to grant you at the end of the day. So we usually keep them out of the litigation and push them towards the remission side. Yeah, you just have the, the owner of the... The I owner of the property, and it's usually yeah. tactical. They do it because they know what the deadline the, the limits are, and, and they, they're hoping that their case won't be valuable enough to be litigated. Uh, so they'll file a claim, and then they'll file a claim it, okay. to hope that it, it take their chance. Yeah. I mean, I know we have, uh, Pam was saying that there's, this has come up in discussion now, especially with the executive 
orders and all of the focus now on wildlife trafficking because we do a lot of, in more recent years, child pornography cases where we're not getting piles of cash from these people's houses. We're getting an obsolete laptop, a camera, and a cell phone. And we can't sell that. For the most part, it's destroyed or sometimes you know, wiped and given to law enforcement to use uh, for law enforcement purposes. But they, they understand that the fear is supposed to zero case with FBI, but they don't look at the thresholds for those. They, they will take the camera. They will take the computer because you want to have it out of the hands of the child pornographer. Um, they're like, it's a little different from yours because that's not contraband. Once they wipe it, they, they could sell it. But you want to buy a 10-year-old laptop. Getting yeah. your hands on it, getting it away from them putting it out of commerce, or in the case of something that can be sold, taking away their ability to, to sell it and deal in it and make it make it burn for them. As a matter of fact, the CITES um, conventions, con conventions of the parties have reiterated on a number of occasions that forfeiture is the first remedy in any violation of the con Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species. And one of the works of the last couple of years for some of us that have been doing this for a while, and Carolyn is one, um, is to just educate people. This is the first remedy we're supposed to engage in, not the last. In fact, because it is, it is the crime. It is the, the thing. Yeah, they want, and it is, most of our crimes are motivated by greed, the, the white collar crimes. That seems like with all the focus on sentencing reform and not filling up our prisons, that forfeiture is a different remedy that takes away why they were doing the crime in the first place, but is it a better option sometimes than sending a low-level drug courier to prison because they know what they were doing wrong and they're probably going to do it again anyway, but once we pull that money from them, that's what really hurts. So same thing with your, your assets are necessarily greedy as having the, the item that they have there. Um, and here's, this one here um, is about pecuniary loss, and this is what I was mentioning earlier, how restitution, you can get a whole pile of things in a restitution order. Our regs, I'm not sure if they're the same as yours, um, define what a victim can recover. An owner can usually get their item back if we choose to grant it. A victim, we're not going to give Madoff's house to one of our victims to <laughs> figure out what to do, sell, live in. We're going to give them cash, and so we have to figure out how they document to us what their loss is. So it's usually the check they invested with Madoff, um, the contract that they thought they were bidding on that wasn't real, so they got no product, things like that, and they have to show us what it is, which is why medical bills or you know, harm, loss of wages, things like that are very hard to quantify. If you have a judgment against someone for a million dollars for your car accident, that's hard to say it's really a pecuniary, it's more of just a judgment. So this is why we're more limited on the, the forfeiture side of the house in paying victims than we sometimes are on the restitution side of the house. And these are some of the things, attorney's fees, investigative expenses that uh, victims are perfectly entitled to on the restitution side with the court, but not entitled to on remission when they file a petition with us. And here's how this works, um, probably the same way as with you. Uh, somebody sends notice, although I don't know if you're required to send notice about the remission process. Our office uh, policy is only for victims that we do. When our owners and lien holders get notice about filing a claim, they simultaneously get notice about the remission yeah. process. It's one form, very tiny font, because it includes 10 things they can choose to do. Um, but we would send notice also to victims separate from the claim notice. We don't want them filing claims. The petition comes in, usually to DEA or FBI, to your agency, or sometimes to the U.S. Attorney's Office. We occasionally get them sent to our office. We need to figure out where they go. But somebody investigates that. Um, like I said, Ask Mills is a centralized decision maker. We don't have people out in the field, so we rely on, on the agents and the AUSAs working these cases to tell us if something is legitimate. And we rely very heavily on those recommendations. We generally do not disrupt what they're asking us to do because they're the ones who know the case. It would only be if for some reason it didn't meet the regulations. So if your, your agents and your attorneys doing these cases feel strongly about something and it meets the regs, that's generally what we follow along with. And then that all comes up to our office, and we review it. So I put this button here for fish and wildlife sort of specifically as a victim. It's hard because the contraband items and those things, but sort of setting aside that type of crime, if fish and wildlife as a government entity is victimized, you might have a loss to, to be compensated for. I wanted for. to ask you about that because one of the issues where this has come up for us um, is with refuges, where we have people trespass from the refuge. We do quite a, a lot of damage. And in the past, whenever I've raised with refuge officers and they come in and go, I wish we had cost recovery, I tell them, I say, when you 
make cases against these people for these trespasses, you ought to be able to, to, to do some kind of restitution order or bail in that um, to be able, if they get any profit out of it, particularly for some of the pot hunting and other um, illegal hunting cases, to get that money back to go, as I would think, to, to, to fix the damage. Are you, is that allowed? So I think on the restitution side of the house from the court, there are allowances for property damage and, and repair to things that the defendant caused harm to. That would probably fit our regs, unfortunately, specifically exclude property damage as something that's compensable. So it wouldn't really fit under the forfeiture. So it would have to be a restitution, be a restitution order. order. I've seen, um, not fish and wildlife, but I've seen banks listed because their, their ATMs were physically ripped out and they give them the amount of money to fix back their ATM machine. So I don't see why that would be any different. Um, because our folks would just assume that they have no recourse whatsoever, and I've told them repeatedly they should raise it with you as attorney when people do these kinds of things, because yeah. I think they do. Well, and, and I don't know, I mean, if they're trespassing, I'm sure, like, if it's a national park, it's whatever, $25 to get on, so they didn't pay their fee, that's not really a big loss. Well, I'm, talking about, them, I'm but, talking about, they didn't just not pay to get on, they may well have paid to get on. They came in, they brought in... They were growing the marijuana. That they're growing marijuana. They're ripping up a restroom. They're they're violating an Indian grave, taking stuff out of it, and selling things on eBay. Those are the kind of cases I'm talking about. Yeah, that that kind of property damage probably not. Um, no. The third bullet on here, though, and, and I don't know enough about how your environmental laws work. When you're talking about these these huge fees that folks pay to go and hunt uh, wild game in Africa, or I don't know if there's any fees here. Equivalent, if they're doing that and they're poaching without the fees, those fees would potentially be a loss really? to the department because they should have paid it. So that one on there, we, we see, you know, if you're supposed to import export fees for things that you don't pay, we've seen agencies file for those. Um, that may be the most relevant to fish and wildlife. Mm -hmm. Aside from the environmental things, if someone at fish and wildlife is embezzling from you or an employee is stealing or you're entering into contracts to do services and the contract isn't completed or is you know fraudulently bid and overbid, um, you could claim losses for those. They're not going to be charged as environmental crimes. They'll be procurement fraud or embezzlement or things like that. But we see almost unfortunately every federal agency filing HHS obviously all the time for the healthcare fraud, USDA for their food stamp fraud, tax fraud, procurement fraud, DOD files like every week with us for some kind of contract fraud. And we give a lot of money back out to government entities, and it's really a fair <coughs> kind of fraud, so it's all of us who are theoretically recovering when we give them these forfeiture funds back, but there are ways for your organization as an entity to be a victim. So if you can be creative and fit some of these things that aren't precluded, like the property damage in our you know, sort of toolkit, that might fit restitution. Um, so let me throw you at a scenario. We, we had a situation a few years ago where we discovered somebody for 10 years had been missing declaring wildlife to avoid paying wildlife inspection fees. Say we made a criminal case against that person and we were able to do forfeitures on some of the shipments. The lady in question was running a fur business and some of her stuff was quite pricey. Could we recover the, all those fees if we could prove them up that she didn't pay over that period of time? Uh, yeah, I mean, we it's basically like people not paying taxes. Yeah. And they, we can, we forfeit money in what they were doing, we would give it back to IRS. Because I had agents looking yeah. at me going, I don't see why we would bother with that. Yeah, I mean, you may not get, I don't know how much your fees are versus the value of the furs. If you make a lot more on the sale, you know, you would only get sort of the portion that you would say, these were the fees that she didn't pay. We'll pay up to that, that amount of your loss. But yeah, licensing and export fees, Commerce Department has been talking with us about some export fees that they're supposed to get on certain things and permits, and sometimes they're not very expensive, but if you have a large company doing it over and over again, it adds up quickly um, and can make a substantial loss. To the it was $100,000 over the course yeah. of 10 years. Yeah. yeah, so if we had forfeited in that case, um, if we did, I don't know if we may still have the money, um, would be something that no, we can do. shipments with boots, they used to be oh. boots, they were worth quite a bit. There were some of the boots where it $500 a pair and she got caught with a, a consignment shipment of four or five hundred. I mean, we wouldn't have gotten it all back, but I remember having a whole conversation with people who just were like, well, this isn't a you know, big deal. Yeah, and that's, we would treat that 
if it was a judicial case and your U.S. attorney or ENRG did it, we would rule not there. But I, if your remission regs account for treating yourself as a victim and you do it administratively through your own process, that would be something that you have to rule on for your own agency. That you know, We're filing a petition and we usually put up a wall and say, you know, if HHS, um, Medicare fraud is a victim, HHS investigative arm can't be the one filing the petition. It has to come from the entity. So wherever in Fish and Wildlife those fees would go, we would recommend that to file the petition, not sort of your investigative arm. Program. Yeah. They are not, they are not the agents. They are the people within the initial yeah. inspection. Okay. Yep. So yeah, just sort of think about that if, if you're filing as an, an entity who's the right and sometimes it's the Office of General Counsel for the whole. We've seen that uh, USDA often has their OGC file for any USDA fraud, and they send the money wherever it needs to go, and we give it back to them. Um, and restoration, I'll talk about really quickly here, so I don't keep you too long, is where I was uh, mentioning the court enters a restitution order, but we also forfeit because the defendant can be made to pay both. If he's not able to pay his restitution separately, we will transfer our funds over to the clerk, and it's essentially a shortcut to remission. The petitioner doesn't have to file something again. The, the victim already went to court, already showed what their losses were. We don't want them to file a petition or relive the whole incident, send all the documents again to the same government, um, and we can just give it to the clerk, and they will already pay it. And especially if there are a lot of victims involved, marshals pay everybody individually. We don't want them to be paying. All the clerk is also paying, and so it's an efficiency process that we set up in policy at our office to allow these funds to get to the clerk instead of redoing essentially the entire restitution proceeding administratively at our office. Um, and some of the benefits are if we have assets forfeited in any context, the DEA administratively forfeits some, the U.S. Attorney judicially forfeits, and the petition process we talked about, that's two different decision makers. So your victim is getting a letter from two different people saying you're granted for this amount or you know, goodness if they are denied by one, granted by another, this can take any any kind of asset. And we send it all at once for one payment to the victim. So it consolidates our funds into one transfer as well. Um, and this one has less steps, so it's easier. Basically, we get that restitution order. Obviously, there's a whole lot wrapped up into that little arrow there that happens prior to the restitution order. But that happens, and then the USAO um, or ENRD potentially would ask us to do this and they make a couple of representations to us that essentially mirror what would have been told to us via a petition directly from the victim. Um, that everybody was in there, their losses were correct, the victim wasn't involved, everybody at the agency who worked this case looked at it and they agree, and that's essentially what the remission process tells us as an ask mill. So this is a much preferred method. We're seeing this much more frequently in victim cases this obviously does not apply to the owner or lien holder process because they can't be listed in restitution orders. This would only be a mechanism for victims to get money. Um, but we're seeing these happen as criminal cases seem to be becoming more prevalent and they're tying the forfeiture back to it. And like I said, this is easy because the clerk can just pay it out all at once as opposed to the marshals having to do multiple distributions when we have assets coming in at different times. So this is a, a huge benefit for our program. Um, and only ASMILs can do that. Um, but basically, I think we're good on time here for a couple minutes, so I'm going to let you have questions. But these are the sort of three methods that we talked about. Remission, I think, is probably most germane to the type of cases that you're going to see because you'll have some owners and lien holders coming in, um, but maybe Fish and Wildlife will be able to get some of your money back here through the remission process as well um, if we do end up forfeiting these funds. We don't want to keep them in our forfeiture fund when there's someone out there who you said a foreign yeah. government, if it's listed as the owner, could potentially be, because that's yeah. the other the situation I could see us seeing. Um, yeah, we've had, if we treat them as an owner slash victim, I guess, because they were victimized by the item being stolen right. or taken yeah. or removed, and then we can also say they, they own it under their law, so it's an easier um, grant because they meet all the requirements of everything. Um, we've had some domestic, like museums have had artifacts or things stolen, so those are more theft because they don't, they're gifted to them. They own them, I guess, but they're on display in their museum, so we would treat those as a victim owner petition as well for the, the cultural property or the, the paintings and things like that from foreign countries. 
Um, and I put really quickly in here a couple of cases I did some looking to see. I don't know if these are familiar to you. Oh, <laughs> to relive memory lane here, where I know I had some calls on this one, maybe two or three years ago. It was a while ago. Um, trying to figure out like where the it was mahogany, I think, where the wood would go, and would we give it back to Gibson if they filed a petition, or say no, they were not innocent if they filed. We're not going to give it to them through the petition process, even if that's what everyone's recommending. We're not going to give them back these items. Um, so that's the case that we had at Arsenal been called on a couple of times. Um, some other ones we got called on were this is in the Virgin Islands. It was black coral being illegally um, taken, and so there were also cash assets seized. I don't know if there was a boat, so the marshals took the cash. This was one of those weird custody cases that we were talking about where I think Fish and Wildlife or um, no, we had a kept island. all of that. And we took the cash and the boat, which obviously causes consternation for, for good reasons, that you're taking all of the non-valued non assets and storing them, and we're pulling in the cash because of the way the fund works. But um, this was another one that we had gotten some calls on down in the Virgin Islands. This one was a little bit older. Um, iguanas, I'm sure that you guys kept these in your possession, and the marshals absolutely did not take three iguanas from you out in California. Um, but the, I, I'm glad that you mentioned California does a lot of these because that's where this was from. And we have an asset tracking system where every single seized asset is listed. This is honestly one of my favorite assets because it's, it's listed in our system as three iguanas and their offspring or any. Actually, actually, that was one of the more challenging cases <laughs> because the San Diego Zoo was supposed to keep them isolated from the rest of the population. But unfortunately, the little critters jumped the fence. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you have to be creative with live animals sometimes. I know I think the snakes that were given back to Brazil were held in a zoo in Utah because I, I don't know that that was a fish and wildlife case and the Bureau certainly doesn't have capabilities of storing snakes anywhere. So these are some of the more challenging things that we'll get called at our office because we're kind of the the catch all unit that does a lot of questions. We do victim issues, we do law enforcement issues, but we do a lot of the tracking and asset maintenance questions come to us, so we hear about animals a lot. So this one had, had jumped out, and then we've seen this come up more and more, um, ginseng. Yeah. I don't know, it, apparently it's a very valuable crop. I was unaware. <laughs> we've seen cases across the country more recent than this one, um, and I think you can actually sell that and make a profit from it, which would go into the forfeiture fund. Um, and we've given some money back out to state and local law enforcement when they assist with the case, or potentially um, if the state had export you know, fees or licenses that they had to pay the state, sort of taxes and things would be a victim and could file as a victim for their unpaid taxes or licenses. What fees. about, we had a case involving illegal excavation of ginseng by the members of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Tribe. I remember it distinctly because they came here and put a curse on me. Um, that, um, <laughs> I think it's working. <laughs> damage our regs don't provide for that, and that's the kind of case that the department is doing. 
So we're trying to be a little forward thinking, not only with the thresholds, but also who really is the victim and what should we be compensating um, under our victim rights. But restitution has, through statute, I think evolved a little bit to allow broader classes of losses like property damage in some instances. So I, I definitely would, if you can go that route and get restitution, and you know, you use some of these forfeiture tools that Pam talked about, and seize, and we get cash, we trace accounts, and then at the end of the day, you just divert it to restitution and don't do that forfeiture. That's a very successful practice um, in some instances. Obviously, we're the forfeiture section, so we're generally encouraging that you complete the forfeiture, but there are instances we realize that's not, not the best goal for, for everyone to get the forfeiture. Or get the, you know, this shouldn't be about a stat or credit. It should be about what the end game is that they want to do. The yeah. turn the conduct to make the people home. Yeah. yeah, and I know there are instances where if you are partnering like with the FBI or someone who is in our forfeiture fund because they have budgets to pay for case-related expenses, the U.S. Attorney's Office has those kind of budgets and allocations. That there have been some instances, though few I think, where if you're going to partner up on an investigation with one of ours that you know up front, you know what, we're going to have some significant investigative resources here. We're not talking about like just paying your agents. That, you have to do some huge financial tracing or invent some new database or something like that that would be very unique where they enter into an MOU for a cost reimbursement of an investigative type expense up front at the outset um, of the case. So I, I believe they've done that in some instances, but generally what everyone says is can you just pay us for our, our time, you know, our agent's time or our normal cost of business, and that's not really what it's right. meant to be reimbursing for. It would be these unique um, you know, new software or something that you have that we don't, that we want to work with you um, by pairing up with one of our, our agencies. So there, there are ways, I, sometimes it's just figuring out and being creative with the forfeiture fund rules about how money comes in and goes out, but if you can sit in the victim context, that's probably one of the easiest ways to get money back out to Fish and Wildlife. Uh, I think that was the last picture I had. So we do have a um, public website, and I think some of these guys and the flippers are on there as well. We have a victim guide. Um, it's in, I think that's right here. But there's two. This is a public victim guide about how we get money back to victims. That's on our website. Um, and we have a public and internal website. Craig, I don't know. Can Fish and Wildlife access to Aspelo? Ian, our deep can. Julio, they, yeah, they can send out instructions um, on how to do that. So. Okay. And Ian, our I think, should be able to access it through yeah, our CrimLink or whatever, um, or your equivalent, maybe a JNet. Um, but that's, this is our internal site where all of this stuff is definitely posted. Our public site has a smaller grouping of documents that are, that are for public consumption on there if you have any questions about anything probably that Pam and Nicole also talked about. They'll be good resources. More so on the internal site, there's go-bys and things like that. And if you guys have good go-bys, I think of Carolyn Carol on the line, who's done some of these longer uh, indictments or things explaining or doing the comparisons between hunting and your national treaties, that we might put some environmental go-bys up there. If this is a we new section, yeah. you can certainly put some forfeiture go-bys up there of your type of You know, treaty. you guys yeah. should talk to the, he, the, he, the, there's a guy in API actually talked to him in a conference who, they did some, and you probably, maybe you have, maybe you know about it, they did some really innovative stuff with uh, one of their big cases involving illegal drilling activities and some clean uh, water issues, yeah. where they actually went out and pushed out the people in the area, you know, this is your groundwater, this is your drinking water, do you have any, and, and got them all to put in claims and stuff. And he said it helped them with the criminal environmental case they made, but it also, it was, it, it, it helped build community support for the case. Yeah, I mean, forfeiture is, I think, but similar, it doesn't necessarily build community support, but if there are agents are doing, that you're working with, are doing tracing, are doing all these other things, it's not only for the purpose of forfeiture, it's for the purpose of evidence in the case as well. And if they're identifying victims or possible innocent owners or people who we want to debunk as an innocent owner, they're gathering the evidence as part of their forfeiture process and their case investigative process. So um, there's definitely a lot of different pieces and you know, things mixed up here that you can get to forfeiture or to the case in chief that will be helpful in both. All right, I think we're right on time at the end of the All right. Everybody, yeah. how about to the very yeah. end? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And I'll echo um, Pam and Nicole. My number is on here, or I'm also in this 
the same format as everyone else at DOJ, um, that you can feel free to reach out with questions um, about forfeiture of victims. We'll get it to the right person. I think that my shot back at the office. And I'm going to send out an email to everybody on the list and mm -hmm. copy uh, Jen and Pam and Nicole so you can actually contact them directly. You don't have to remember. Uh, That's right, right. So. I'm going to get these guys on the phone. Um, address and stuff. Yeah, so that can, me, uh, I really, that, that um, forfeiture in a box sounds like a great thing. Yeah, there's uh, on Circio, there's a PDF of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah.